Colin James burst onto the Canadian scene in 88, 89 with his self-titled debut album featuring the big ones, Voodoo Thing and Five Long Years. By 1990, he had his biggest hit. Just came back, peaked at number five. He also had hits with Colin James and the Little Big Band, Cadillac Baby, Surely I Love You, and Breaking Up the House. James hit the top 10 again with the song Savior in 1995, and he's set to release his 20th studio album, Open Road, on November 5th. Down on the bottom. Let's talk yeah. about down on the bottom. Like I, I know I asked you last time uh, where it was. I thought it was Abbotsford or Mission, but where did you where did you do that? And by the way, how long does something like that take? What do you mean? It did take to record? Yeah, to record a video like that. How long does that take? Oh, the video. Oh, that was like two days. I mean, but two days, it didn't have to be two days, but we were trying to get, um, well, it was a bit of a luxury <laughs> to have the two, the second day because initially it was all going to be done in a day. The guy doing the video, uh, Cole Northy, is the son of Craig Northy from The Odds. And Cole, you know, there's not a lot of people out in this doing videos right now because it's not as you know they're not a thing as like they were but everyone likes to use them for the a release and get a vibe and a, a picture of what their album kind of looks like but he is excellent you know he came over and had a meeting with me and i thought right away not only have i known him since he was a kid but he's such a professional and and uh we had a steady cam so it was a steady cam operator me and the director cole and a beautiful beautiful summer day in uh southern bc and what was it a 67 mustang what was that 67 yeah jeez yeah oh it was, it was beautiful but it was a little hair raising for me because the guy who owned the car was a super nice guy but my feet barely hit the clutch you know i mean um at first i felt then as the day went on i found him and ground him a couple of times it felt bad about it. but i i finally got it together and but I had to do these three point turns on these, you know, country roads with culverts on either side with this mint Mustang. But it all worked out. So. That all worked out. Interesting song. Where did the inspiration come from for that? I mean, you know, I looked at that and I'm going, uh, uh, you know, we, we've all been uh, just the title itself. We've all been there. You don't know bad. You don't know good times unless you've had bad times. But where did that come from? Yeah, well, I, I can't take credit for the song. The song was written by Bob Dylan. So, but Bob Dylan never right, right. You told me about this. Yeah, that's right. But he never recorded the, the song. So, uh, uh, a record was called "The New Basement Tapes," and it was um, basically reimagining what Dylan might have put to music. And he allowed it to happen. So he said, "Take my songs. Here's a here's here's my manuscript. See what you can do." So, Elvis Costello was on this particular track, on the original as well as uh, Jim James. And uh, one of the Mumfords, and I, I have, I'm not very, uh, I'm not very up on my Mumfords, so I couldn't tell you which one it is. But uh, uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, it just had a nice. Uh, I, I we tried to rock it up a little more than the one that was done by them. Uh, just you know, and I always like a new rock song in the set, so it's a lot of fun to play. It's kind of like it's got a bit of a Rolling Stones, a kind of vibe to the uh, the playing on it, and. Um, yeah, yeah, I think everyone can relate, especially during two months of downtime during the pandemic. Uh, everything's looking up from here, you know. By the way, I think you're, and it's one of my all-time favorite songs. I'm not a biggest Van Morrison fan, but your version of Into the Mystic, you know, almost makes me cry. Oh, man, thank you. You know, songs like that, and I wish I could tell you that we knew it was a uh, going to do well as a song or that we knew we had, you know, I, I recorded that song twice for that record. The first time I recorded it with uh, Reggie McBride on bass, who was on a Van Morrison record uh, that he did with Dr. John, uh, Into the Music, was it? And then, um, and then uh, we had Jim Keltner, the famous drummer who played on all John Lennon and Ger George Harrison records and Ry Cooter and everybody. But the version we did with them, for whatever reason, just didn't have the pep. It didn't have the magic. So I went home and I was prepared to just drop it from the record. And someone says, you know, we could use a bit more. Uh, it, we, we had a long day of recording. And at the very end of the day in Vancouver at the warehouse studios, Brian Adams, you know, studio, I said, hey, everybody, would you mind if we just tried that one time this into the mystic? And the bass player really didn't know it very well. He wasn't familiar with, I mean, he'd heard it on the radio, but didn't know the bass should be, it is very, there's a bass line that, do, 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 boo, do, do, that everyone plays. Well, he never really noticed it, so he didn't play that. 
And we sent it out as the last song on that record. No one had a clue. I mean, we all liked it. And I, for me, it was kind of my um, tribute to somebody I was a huge fan of. And then it just took off and, and kind of created its own thing. And uh, it, it's my number one song now on most platforms. I mean, it must feel kind of nice uh, going out there and discovering new fans. It is. You know, we started out, I mean, I always, I used to play the Northern States. We'd play Cleveland and Buffalo, but we never really got a handle on it, you know, and it was expensive. So it's kind of one of those things you just kind of, you try and try until you just kind of get exhausted. <laughs> so now in my life, all this time later, um, this kind of came naturally. You know, we played that, we made the Blue Highways record and just, we got a job going on some of those blues cruises with like Taj Mahal and all these different people. And it's what happened when we started on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday on the boat, people went, Oh, great. And most of the people were Canadians in, in my, you know, coming to scene. And then by Wednesday or Thursday, we had turned around and we had started getting um, people kind of going, how is it that we don't know you? And how is it that you have 19 records you know, at the time, 18 records? Yeah. How is it that you have that? And we didn't even know. So it's just been really cool that way. And it, it but it doesn't mean it's going to be any less work. You know, it's a huge country. And um, yeah, like I finally, at least my music's getting into the hands of the pe of people down there who are reviewing records and people who, uh, and, and now getting in front of Buddy Guy on this tour, you know, will just be a blessing because these are nice rooms, 2000 seats and up. And, um, I just it's just gonna be perfect so I, I'm really excited about that oh yeah tell me about the uh, the corner gas stint yeah well the corner gas thing uh Brent Butt I met through Craig Northy because Craig Northy uh, whose son did my video Craig plays on my new record as well on a couple of tunes um Craig wrote the theme song for corner gas so that's Craig's song and Brent Butt as a uh result is a good friend of Craig's and I, I've met Brent a few times uh, myself. So when I got the job though, I had no idea, Janet Wright, who's not with us anymore, but was on that show. She was my first director. I, I, I was an actor for only a year of my life. I was in musical theater and she was my director of the first thing I ever did. So it was great to see her. She was an amazing woman. She was in McCabe and Mrs. Miller, that movie uh so uh i love janet and, and she was exactly who you wanted as a director when you were a young well i never continued acting but you know i had i had lines and i had a whole book i had to learn and i couldn't believe it was you know it was for me it was just one of those things i did on the way to just trying to get to vancouver and starting my music career for real but i appreciated it because i was broke and i made about 700 bucks a week for about a year or so it was big news for me when you dropped out of school at 16, like were, were the parents going, you're freaking crazy, or did they know you had something? How did that go? When I dropped out of school, my mom and dad had split, and um, it was just time for me. I would, I had, I had, um, I hadn't quite got finished grade 10. I was playing in bands. I was, I was up all the time because I was in a rock band at the time. We were opening up for the like Subhumans and DOA and stuff like that. I wasn't really. I, you know, I shouldn't have been in that scene, but I was because I was I, like any other kid. I wanted to be part of the scene. So the writing was on the wall. At one point, the principal said, you know, would Colin come to the office? And I went in there and he says, well, I don't know why you bother. You've got three classes a day and you're not going to get you're not going to pass with those classes. And I looked at him and I said, you're right. Why am I doing what am I doing here? Like, I realized at that moment that that I'd been spinning my wheels for a while. And I know it's only grade 10, but I'd already been playing since I was 13 and in bands. And um, it was just time to go. So I moved to Winnipeg. I um, moved in with a family we knew and um, started playing on the street in Winnipeg and, and uh, tried to go back to high school. And it was a bust because you had to do all your own studying. You had to do your own. There was no one to tell you what to do. It's here's your book. Have all your tests done by the end of the year. And <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. And I got my first job at the Winnipeg Folk Festival. I got a workshop and a blues workshop with my band, The Hoodoo Man. And that led to me opening up for George Thorogood and John Lee Hooker when I was 16. That year, I did Thorogood, three shows for Thorogood, three show, one show with John Lee Hooker. 
and kind of never looked back, you know, I moved to Winnipeg, started meeting all the blues scene there and uh, just kept moving. Were there somebody in that group or anybody that, that stood out for you that might've said something that really made a difference because everyone has bad days, bad weeks. Am I going to continue doing this? How can I do this? How can I make a living doing this? What was there words of encouragement? God knows I've had enough when I needed them, but for you, there was a someone, something that stands out. Well, what stood out to me was I used to come back to Regina because I get broke. I'd move to Winnipeg. I'd come back. I, one day I was sitting in, at, at the, the, the we, we used to call it the, the club. It was kind of a, uh, it was kind of a members only hippie club where it's just everyone I knew would go there. And, and um, somebody I knew and respected who was a fiddle player, kind of a bit of a tough nut. And he came up to me and said, why are you still here? in region why are you why aren't you somewhere else by now and i just kind of went oh my god yeah yeah you're right i'm just here because it's safe and it's easy it's easier here you know and that's what caused me to to leave you know and i did about a year and a half in montreal um that was i was really broke and and, uh, we had cockroaches and mice and had to play in the subways ended up in vancouver you know eventually finally And it just kind of kept moving, but. um, He gave you permission almost, you know, it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. I knew, I realized I was never going to pass and, 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 you know, I was just wasting time. I was ready to be, I was ready to start learning and getting out there. And and if I spent two more years in high school, we just kind of wasted time. A lot happened in that time. I mean, some pivotal stuff happened in that time. So it was the best decision for me, but I can't, I can't wish that on other people. I mean, for parents of kids who are playing, people ask me quite often, you know, what, you know, what was the method? What, what, and I said, there's no method. I mean, you just have to want it and really have a blind faith that it's going to be something that'll work for you. And then the rest of it is just being honest with yourself and if that's going to be true or not, you know? Okay. When you, when you left home, I'm just kind of curious. And it's a question I ask all artists. You're leaving home, mom and dad, I got my pots and pans. I'm getting out of here. What was in your, what was in your record collection then? Well, I lived out of a garbage bag for quite a number of years. So there was no, by the time I got to Winnipeg, nothing came with me, but a garbage bag full of clothes um, at the end of the day. What were you listening to when you were 16? What were you like? James Cotton. Well, so I moved to this little place in Winnipeg uh, that had a turntable in the basement and Bruce Springsteen. So I remember listening a lot to Born to Run that year. But that year, uh, I went and saw James Cotton at the Winnipeg Folk Festival. And there was probably 18,000 people. It was the final show of the night. So it's a, there was a pretty big festival. Maybe big, maybe because I was younger, it seemed huge to me. And he came out and just slaughtered. It was like, because folk festivals, Winnipeg always got a fair amount of up-tempo stuff as well. Not unlike the Evanston Folk Festival. They've always been pretty good at some folk stuff, some world music, and then, you know, a pretty good hit of uh, some pop pop music as well. But anyway, Cotton came up. I was 16 years old. I saw him sing and play the harmonica, killed it, and just killed The audience were just, it was just so good, and it just kind of changed everything for me. With the first album, were you, was there a part of you that was surprised? I mean, with the first album, it just came out of the gate. And I mean, people are telling me about you, and it's like, you know, people are talking. You know, in radio, we're always told, to, you know, you can't do it as much anymore, but say something that at least once in your show that someone at the water cooler might say something about. But when you're talking to, you know, music people and they're talking about people, and I mean, there was a real buzz, right? Which uh, was the best thing you can have. But did you know when that, I know there was a lot of producers, a lot of ki- cooks in the kitchen for that one. Yeah. And one producer, Tom, didn't want yeah. you to do blues. Uh, yeah. uh did you know at the end of it that you had something? Not necessarily. I mean, we were going on all, you know, things were, you know, we were playing. We, I knew, I mean, I look back at that record personally, and I'm not happy with it. You know, I don't know if I ever will be happy with it, but I sound like a child to me now when I listen to those tracks. Was it because maybe back then you didn't know what you didn't know, like a lot of artists say about albums, but how, what's your take on when you look at it now? Well, you know, well, I just think I sound like it's, it's a very mixed bag. That record, it, it jumps all over the place. There was five different producers. Tom Dowd should have been a match made in heaven, but he really, he had already recorded Clapton and John Coltrane and 
you know, and he wanted me to be like the Arrhythmics. As they, he said, I think you should be making music like the Arrhythmics. And I just kind of went, I don't know, you know. And so we ended up getting nothing, spending a whole lot of money. And I had to fly to L.A. and do the whole record with Danny Korchmar. Um, cool. And Danny Korchmar had worked with, you know, Don Henley. And that was yeah. his group of fame and James Taylor and everybody. And I loved working with Danny. But I also had Niels Dorfman on that record. He would work with the Dire Straits. I mean, it was just a very expensive record. So it's not what you want for your first record. Bob and Rock was, was Bob Rock part of that? Bob Rock did the first two singles, Why July and Five Long Years. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just think it could have been a better record. I liked my second record better. I think, uh, I think it was more... It was more R and B and blues. We did it in Memphis for that reason, and Joe Hardy was the producer. But I think out of all three, I'm probably most proud of uh, the Little Big Band one because I think you know after two records like that, and I, you know I'm really I'm I'm bummed that Stephen Ray Vaughan didn't hear a Little Big Band one because I knew, you know, I felt like maybe I went too pop on the first record and and. Uh, and I don't have any regrets. Listen, I love Five Long Years. It's not, it's not, I, I do. I, I'm very proud of that song. And it's hard, you know, I think some people have the luxury of making their best record when they're a kid, but not everyone. And you got to be there to grow, you know, and I just thank, you know, I'm thankful that I've had 20 records to grow because, you know, you're not, you're not always going to have it together when you're in that first record, you know, you're going to do your best. Yeah. Uh, but it's pretty overwhelming when you're when you're all of a sudden you're getting flown to L.A. and you're having <laughs> dinner with, you know, it was overwhelming for me. I can't I, honestly it was. And and uh, and I think with Joe Hardy, I found a producer on my second record that we did in Memphis that that spoke to me. It was me and him against the world. It was it was he's he, he we he took care to make sure I was OK with it. And I love Joe. He was the best. He was Billy, one of Billy Gibbons' best friends. And, and I miss him dearly. He passed a, uh, a few years ago now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But anyway, and then, and then, uh, then I had, the, you know, Chris Kimsey came to do the little big band. And I guess what I, what I mean to say is I really had a chance to put it on the line and say, I mean it. I do love this stuff. I'm not just masquerading as a, as a blues artist and playing pop, you know? So it was a chance for me to really, go on you know throw throw my cards down you know? tell me about stevie ray vaughn well i just have nothing but uh fantastic memories and i think the farther i get away from the times that we did spend together the more i realize what he did for me you know and and um you know selflessly and i can't imagine his everyone wanted me to be on the road when he when he when he took me on the road and i know what it's like it's a priest it's it's uh, a place where you have uh, uh, where you can go and, you know, buses or, you know, bands need them to get away from everything. So it's like, you know, I was probably invading that bus on Stevie's uh, allowing me to. And they gave me a, you know, they let me put my guitar in the bay and they let me, they let me, uh, they bought me a room. I had no money. I was on the road for a couple weeks. So that must have cost a, a mint, you know, whatever it was a night for my room. And uh, I just, you know, you bought me plane tickets and uh, uh, I just have, you know, we, we just became fast friends, Stevie and I, from the minute we met each other in, in Saskatoon backstage, we had a lot of the same references. We had a lot of the same musicians we liked and he was uh, just a great guy. And then I, I guess the worst thing that happens when someone is lionized and, and, um, you know, he's become like a Bob Marley figure in, in the, you know, in the Jimi Hendrix you know, figure. And, but what, what, what's forgotten in that, what's forgotten in that is a guy who was just a, a funny, awesome guy, you know, and a talented guy beyond belief, you know. I mean, watching him play was like scary. It was actually frightening because uh, the way he, the way he tapped in, because, I, you know, I like, I love guitar playing. I love singing, but I love it to all have a point, not just playing for playing sake or, or being fast. And Stevie is that one guy that could not only blow your mind with speed, but that wasn't the point, you know, it was all soulful and it was all done in, in, in the right amount of, in the amount around from the right place, you know, and I think that's what made him super special. Five long years. Um, true story. 
girlfriend's parents, right? Long trip. Well, yeah. Uh, I When I told you I moved to Winnipeg, that's exactly what I did. I moved to Winnipeg uh, in, uh, in with a, girl, a, a, a girlfriend. And uh, we took a drive with her mom and her boyfriend all the way down to New Mexico uh, that year. We went all the way down uh, through, you know, Taos, New Mexico, uh, Santa Fe. I um, saw Wavy Gravy. Uh, Wavy Gravy, the hippie, was at one of the places we went to. At a, it was a clown camp, if you can believe it. We dropped somebody off at a clown camp, a little kid. <laughs> and we kept on going. We went all the way to Chaco Canyon in the New Mexico desert. And uh, You could have been a clown, man. You could have been a clown. I'm glad you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and we uh, we went swimming in the Rio Grande. So the lyrics in the song, the swimming in the Rio Grande, listening to the Mexican band, singing songs of love when our hearts were young. That whole uh, that song was about running into each other. Maybe four or five years later, when we had taken different paths, and she'd had a kid by then. So I was just looking at a life that could have been that wasn't, and and that's where the song came. Yeah. Uh, so I heard you say before that voodoo thing started with a riff. Voodoo thing started because we were in desperation. We were working with Tom Dowd. I wasn't getting along with Tom. We weren't getting stuff down on tape. We were even having trouble getting another version of Why'd You Lie, which never made it out of that studio because the first original was so good. At, well, I mean, why would you want to redo it anyway? We ended up with some very terrible version of it. And uh, I was panicking. You know, here we were. Money was flying out the door. My first record ever not getting along with the producer he wanted me to sing it in a quiet voice he wanted me to go way down south where the man grows a girl like a story like like uh, poke salad annie by uh you know uh and it just i i just didn't feel that was right and i had to say to him well i don't agree you know so we ended up having to stop working together and uh I wrote it in my hotel room. We were down there. So way down south where the mangroves grow deep in the swamp down in the bio. So we were living in South Beach, Miami, taking drives to the Keys once in a while and getting used to that. This is this is South Beach, Miami before it was gentrified. So all those Art Deco places are still there, but only two of them have been redone and have fancy restaurants. The rest is like pretty iffy uh, at the time. This is 1980, uh, 88, 87, 88, I guess. And 87, 80s, yeah, something like that. So anyway, that was uh, that was a desperation song. And I actually remember phoning and saying, I'm going to call it Voodoo Thing. And my, my manager saying, you can't, because of Voodoo Child, you just can't. And I said, I don't agree. So again, I had to stick, I don't agree. And I uh, stuck to my gun. Okay, number five hit, just came back. Rocker, and uh, that one's a complicated story. So I didn't write the original. Uh, the original was written... I rewrote the song. It was brought to me. And uh, my friend, Daryl Burgess, uh, uh, had, had, had written it. And the words weren't quite there for me. You know, when, uh, when I first saw you, I heard a bl- a, I, I saw a blinding light. Uh, <laughs> a woman child wrapped in dynamite. That was the original lyric. So I had to change some lyrics. So uh, when I first saw you, I heard the angels sing. Uh, I thought of Adam and Eve and the love th- and that love thing. So I had to change it. And, and I have to be honest, I wasn't a big fan of it. So when we were demoing it, we came up here and I did a demo of it. Before we sent it to Joe Hardy, I actually tried to kind of sabotage it. I thought it was like, I thought it was kind of dumb. So I, uh, I actually tried to ruin it. Uh, and we sent it to the producer and the record company. Everyone came back saying, do you think that's the, that's the song? I went, you have got to be freaking kidding me. So here's an example where I was dead wrong. So there's other ones when I was right. <laughs> and I was wrong about stuff with Tom Dowd, by the way. Tom Dowd uh, actually wanted me to listen to some songs by a great songwriter named uh, Jerry Williams. And this is where I got it wrong. With If I had I listened to Tom, I probably would record Running on Faith before Eric Clapton. I probably would have recorded um, uh, Pretending, uh, No Alibis, because all those songs were on the tapes I was given and they hadn't been cut yet. And I said no, because at this point we weren't getting along and I didn't really want to hear any more ideas from him. And I, I got to tell you, like, I don't mean to disparage Tom Dowd because he was a genius and had a lot of years of amazing work. It's just an example of when just, it just wasn't going to work for us. 
<laughs> but he was, I mean, his legacy is massive. Bobby Darren, uh, the shark has pretty teeth there, you know, Mac the Knife, that was Tom Down, you know, John Coltrane, uh, Ornette Coleman, you name it. I mean, the Giants, Eric Clapton, uh, Allman Brothers, you know. Yeah. Okay. In high school, were you that music guy? Yes, but I flunked music. So I was a music guy who didn't go to school who didn't go to class. Okay. Stones or the Beatles? Stones. Oh, I knew you'd say that. Paul, John, George, or Ringo? John. What side, outside of music, what are you really good at? Can you cook? Can, what do you do? I used to cook. I don't cook anymore. Um, what would be a hidden talent? Of, I'm a good speller. <laughs> I don't know why, because I only have grade 10 education, but I just, I, I tend to spell well. I don't know why that is. Um, I, I'm, I'm, you know, really, uh, you know, I, I can't really think of anything. I, I'm a history buff, but that's not a skill. Oh, I don't know that 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 changes your wiring being into history. I think that's a I call I would I consider that because I yeah, love history. I, just love, I, I, I I'm fascinated by history and even ancient history, like even more so ancient history. Like I just read a, a book called The Ancestors that talked about uh, DNA how they can go back to a lot of the things they discovered years ago with DNA now and, and change theories of when we got here, when people were in caves in England and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, I can read some pretty dry stuff and be pretty happy. Well, they used to say you can't change the past. And my, my uncle once told me, he says, well, yeah, but if you find out Uncle Bob was at, was kind of grumpy in 76, you find out uh, he was suffering from whatever, then your idea, your perception of the past at least changes and that's what that's what's great about DNA. God, we're finding those serial killers. That's all I'm saying. Okay, um, what makes you cry? Oh, geez, what makes me cry? Don't tell me Hallmark shows. Oh, I like I like those. Oh no, God, I would not. I don't, I don't do that. <laughs> I would just you know, I don't know, sentimentality. I suppose you know. You think about I I, I go back over the years of raising kids, and and uh, we had two kids, and watching them grow and all those years that you'll never get back, you know, that, that time moves on and that's the way it goes. And that's just the end of the story. I guess that. I point in your career so far. You know, I feel it's still, I still waiting for it, man. You know, uh, but good attitude, <laughs> but high point in my career, I guess, you know, yeah, I'm still waiting for it. I, I you know, it's, it's, there's been some great moments, but they're, they, I can't say they're the high point. Can I tell you something? I, I find that's one of the toughest questions I ask artists. And I, I, I was surprised by that. But having asked it so many times, uh, people are going, a lot of folks are saying, the older artists are going, still coming, man. It's going yeah. away. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's how I feel. I, you know, I, maybe the first time I played Massey Hall, I realized that I would gotten out of the bars and then I, I, I made a big move with the manager at the time to get out of bars for for good and it was a scary decision and because it meant you had to reinvent yourself and be perceived in a new way and i i didn't have the faith that, that would happen but we we did it so i remember being on massey hall one day and saying we did it i think i had two nights in a row and i thought awesome what are your top three guitars lady is the blue She's lady I got when she was like, uh, I got it when in 1988 and I had a Fender endorsement. So they gave me three guitars. I only have one of them left. And um, it's been with me through playing with Stevie. It's played with Buddy Guy. It's played with Bonnie Raitt. It's played with uh, uh, ZZ Top. It's, play, it's just played with uh, Steve Miller. It's played with just all kinds of people. And uh, I love it. It's not a, well, I said to my wife, it's not a vintage guitar. She says, how old do you think that guitar is? I said, okay. And then this one here is my 63. And I've had, you know, I, it's born before me and that's cool. Um, I love all my guitars. There's not really any of them that are just sitting around for no reason. Although I do have one that's signed by Albert King, Albert Collins, Pop Staples, Buddy Guy, I'll show you. Yeah, please. Thank you. I don't play this one. Because it got it's it was only signed, it was signed by the same pen by the same people, all at once. So wow. that's Teeny Hodges who wrote "Take Me to the River." Yeah, that's uh, Albert King. 
That's Pop Staples to Colin James. God bless Pop Staples. That's Buddy Guy. And that's Otis Rush. And that's Albert King. Wow. Thank you. And no, I appreciate you showing me that. <laughs> okay, I've only got three more for you. What's the biggest starstruck moment where you met someone, you're going, I can't believe I'm sitting across from this dude or dudette? Who, who, who would that be? Was there something that stands out? I think years ago, the first time I met Mavis Staples, she was on a show with, we, we, she, she was on my record. She was on my uh, Bad Habits record. And, um, but before that, the first time I met her, we all sat in this, um, in a bar, Colin Linden, myself, Mavis, and her sister, Yvonne. And just got to know Mavis that night. And I just thought, here's this woman that my parents used to play Staples Singers records. And here she is. You know, it was just, that was, you know, and she's this nicer, nicer than you could ever, ever have hoped. So I guess that would be it. She played with Bruce Hornsby a few years ago. And I remember going, I got chills. I mean, I, it was crazy. Um, uh, uh, outside of any place you've ever lived, what's your favorite place? To, where's your favorite place to visit? I love going to Italy. You know, we've been going to Tuscany and uh, the Amalfi Coast. We went uh, a couple of years ago and uh, uh, I just love it. Venice, man. I, I just, you know, people disparage Venice because it's so crowded and I get that. But I've always gone in October. So when I've gone, it's always been off season. And lately it's been so warm that the last time we were there, it was like October was like 85, 90 degrees. It was shorts weather. And but Venice is like just remarkable to me. It's like, what a ridiculous city. It's, it's insane. What scares you? Oh, it scares me. Um, what scares me? Well, it's life. <laughs> life in general. There's a lot to this. Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, you know, everything. <laughs> everything scares me. When you were a kid, what was your favorite TV show? I like Bonanza. Mm -hmm. But, uh, um, Geez, uh, well, the Flintstones. A yabba dabba wilma. Outside of your family, what thing can you not live without? It's the last one. What can I not live without? What can I not live without? Well, music is the thing I can't live without. <sighs> and my dogs. I love having my dogs. My dog, I'm a big dog guy. We what kind four. of dogs do you have? They're all sizes. I have a um, sheepdog, a purebred sheepdog. I've got a... Uh, little tiny toy cup like mini like tiny tiny little poodle it's like it's like a, like a tiny little thing and we have a uh, golden doodle who's 12 or 13 maybe 13 now getting a little old now but she's still doing good and annabelle is a shih tzu wow you, you're not kidding